My name is Tony Arzoni. Um, my father's parents um, are from Sicily. Uh, my grandfather was Vito Arzoni. He was born in Memphis. Uh, my grandmother was Rosa Montalbano Pizzo. Um, I was born in Columbus Hospital. I was born and raised in Chicago. We lived in the Deep Paul area. Um, for a long time on the corner of Fullerton and Southport. Uh, then we moved because my younger sister, my older sister and I brought home Bella. Oh, my mother was pregnant, so um, as a result, my younger sister was born deaf. Um, and then we moved north uh, to St. Gregory the Great's Parish, and they had a deaf school there, um, in the Edgewater area. My mother, we still have a house. Um, it's between Bryn Mawr and Clark, between, uh, what's well, Clark and Glenwood? Just off Bryn Mawr on Hollow Street. Um, I went to St. Gregory's. Um, I want to tell you that uh, one of my, uh, uh, just briefly, briefly at St. Josephat's when we lived in the Deep Hall area, we were trained to say, Praise be Jesus Christ, good morning, Father. Or, Praise be Jesus Christ, good morning, Sister. Uh, my older sister and I took this habit to uh, St. Gregory's. And by that time, it was like, Praise be Jesus Christ, good morning, Sister. The nuns and, and, and the priests just looked at us and finally told, one nun said, what did you say? And I said, praise be Jesus Christ. Good morning, sister. And she said, stop that. <laughs> um, I went to St. George High School. was taught by the Christian brothers. My brothers were sent to the Jesuits. We still, they went to Ignatius. I didn't have a choice. Um, I'm unhappy about that, but what can I do? I attended the University of Illinois. Um, I came back and lived on Taylor Street. One year, I lived on Floor 9. I taught for a couple of years at St. Uh, uh, um, uh, Mary's. Uh, um, I tried to get a teaching position in Chicago at least a couple times, and all both times, um, the people in charge preferred writers from New York. They themselves were from New York, so maybe they just simply thought that these writers were more, were just more acceptable. Um, I taught at Old Dominion University in Virginia for a while. I started a writing program there. Then for 20-some years, I taught at Indiana University um, in their MFA program. Um, I founded their um, ethnic uh, literature program and their ethnic literature uh, courses because that's what I wanted to teach. Um, I was named a chancellor's professor. Um, I don't know how that happened. Um, they must have wanted to give it to a writer. Um, and now, um, I, I just, this last spring, left IU and uh, now live in Portland, Oregon. Though I still have dreams about teaching. Um, so I think I want to connect with a little residency program. Um, I want to read real briefly from In the Garden of Papa so I want to read five pages. Um, and I, I've got a section here. It's from a chapter called Cavaduzos of Cicero. And the reason I chose it is because I think it connects work with religion. And I think that, um, and it also might, I, I also, I, I, I'm also really fond of this character, Gerardo Cavaduzo. Okay. Um, we use only the finest ingredients, everything top of the line, no shortcuts, nothing fake or artificial, imitation or second rate. Our show, oh, I should tell you, he's a baker. <laughs> Our sugar is only the purest granulated. Our salt is the very best from the sea. You can sift through any barrel of our flour and see not one single gnat. Hey, there's a shop I won't name, two blocks south of here. They use a flour so full of flies. The customers think the bread is poppy seed. <laughs> I know, cuts, it flour, cuts its flour with sawdust in the name of St. Rosalie. Our flour is pure 100% wheat. Our milk and cream only yesterday were still part of the cow. That's one of the reasons why we moved out here to Cicero from the city, to be closer to the farmer. Our honeys, both dark and light, are so sweet that the beehives that produce them don't zzz, they mm. <laughs> Our almonds. The taste floats on the tip of the tongue. Now, you don't want an almond that bites the tongue back. An almond should caress the mouth delicately, like a breeze swaying a new leaf on a tree. The same is true of cinnamon. There you aim for an elegant pungency, a 
somewhat darker taste that also arouses the nose. A nut, bark, or bean should persuade and seduce the taste buds, never dominate or overwhelm. We select all our spices and flavorings with the utmost care. My Carla and I search constantly for new combinations. If only the mouth had time enough to sample them all. <laughs> our vanilla is so silky that just its smell makes you think you're floating away on a cloud. Our cocoa, coca, bursts warmly across the tongue with an assurance as complete as an embrace. You know the three wise men who brought baby J's new gold, frankincense, and myrrh? I think much better gifts would have been vanilla and almond, cinnamon and cocoa. What else, other than the Madonna's most sweet and holy milk, could have given the child more delight? We use only the purest butter, never oleo or lard. Even a goat's tongue, tongue can tell the difference. Butter lends a lightness to the dough that its greasy impersonators can't possibly match. We spare no expense. Our eggs, they're so fresh, we crack them when they're still warm from the hen. And clean, I scrub each egg with a little brush until its shell is so shiny it hurts my heart to have to break it. Of course, <laughs> with food, you can never be too sanitary. You're right, we could eat off the floor. You're standing on, and your kitchen floor too, I bet. Here, have a taste. Biscotti, just five minutes out of the oven. Yes, yes, of course, it's free. Free taste, the Americani way. Try it and believe me, you like? Isn't that one of the most delicious things you ever put in your mouth? A dozen? Sure. Or maybe you'd like two dozen this bag and hold two dozen easy. Our biscotti never goes stale, though your family will eat them up too fast to find that out. Two dozen it is, and for your hardworking husband, I'll throw in two extra. No husband? Go on. Not married? A knockout like you? I can't believe it. You're pulling my leg. These days, it pays to appetize. I talk to everybody who walks in, though the Mugheri don't let me go on for 10, go on a tenth as long. They know me well and have heard it all before. Cavaduzo, cavaduzo, they say with a laugh. You allow your tongue to gallop around too many words. It's a joke on my name. I laugh along with them. If I wanted to hear a sermon, they tell me, I'd go to church. For a speech, I'd visit the aldermen, or I'd drop by Bug House Square. They're entitled to a smile after working all day. The women at home with their kids doing the cooking and washing and ironing. The men shoulder to shoulder in the factories operating the complex machines of American industry. Factory, home, shop, the difference is small. Work is work. Each, every shoulder drags across. Each head bleeds beneath its own crown of thorns. Everyone labors on one type of assembly line or another doing the same things over and over every day, all day long, sunrise to sunset, day after day after day. I remind myself of this whenever I grow weary, when it's four in the morning in the dead of winter and I want to remain curled in bed beside Carla's dark warmth, when it's summer, 95 degrees, and the temperature of my kitchen becomes so high I swear I'm baking too. When I see a shortcut in a recipe and the devil whispers, Cavaduzo, listen to me. I know an easier way. No one will ever know, Cavaduzo. In, those, in these moments when I'm tempted to make not the best loaf of bread I can, but something merely passable, something the mouth will not too strenuously object to, I think of what it means that working people eat and depend on me. I pretend that my dear mother and father will break the next loaf. And then I think the same of their parents, then their parents. And when I'm so tired that even my great-grandmother Kruchafisa's face doesn't encourage me, I make believe I've been selected as the baker for the Last Supper, and Jesu Christu will hold my bread up in his hands. Manja, he'll say to the apostles. Taking his example, I draw the next breath and continue. Let me tell you how Cavaduzos of Cicero began. One day in our former shop down on Chicago Avenue, just west of Hudson Street, near St. Philip and Easy's in Chicago's Little Italy, a man stopping by for a loaf of bread told me that he was moving to Cicero to work at a new factory being built there, Western Electric. Line work, he said, acceptable pay, assembling the earpieces of telephone. Make mine loud, I said, the one we got here on the wall. I pointed to our shop's pay telephone, its receiver is way too low. Oh, he said, I can fix that easy. 
As I made change for his coin, he unscrewed all our phone screws and was disconnecting the various different wires inside the piece you hold up to your ear. Of course, we never heard one sound out of that telephone again. But in passing, the man did say how much he missed eating our bread. So I said, don't they have bakeries where you're going? And he said, what do you think? There's a Sicilian bakery on every street corner in Palmetto? I said, perhaps not Sicilian, but maybe Napolitan. And he said, what do you think? There's a Napolitan bakery on every corner? So I said, perhaps not Napolitan, but maybe General Basin. He said, do you think there's even a General Basin bakery on every corner, even every other corner? So I said, well, perhaps not Genovese, but maybe Tuscan. <laughs> I hear the Tuscani don't make too bad a loaf of bread, but not sweet, he said, with a sad shake of his head. Not sweet like your Sicilian bread. In truth, there's no bread on earth as good or sweet as Sicilian. No higher compliment you can pay a person, living or dead, than to say he or she's as good as bread. Mm -hmm. I reached for a loaf and gave it a kiss as he again said, you know, I'll really miss this. Here, my friend, I said, breaking off the loaf's end, breaking off a piece for me, and pouring two glasses of Chianti. Any crust of bread, I said, is good as if nourishment you lack. He knocked back his glass and said, maybe if you're sick or cold and dead, but since I'm still alive and hot, I'll say there are some breads I would not want to put too near my face. So I said, in this new place, is there really no good bread? Go on, I said, you're pulling my leg. He said, I beg you, listen, there's not even a Tuscan bakery there. And I said, that the Tuscani make their share of decent bread, but not fair, he said. Not rich and sweet like this. God bless this wheat himself. Eat, I said, breaking off another piece. At least today, he said, I'll feast and end up poor. He pulled my sleeve and said, I grieve to think of the thousand and one Christiani just like me, who will work all day long in the hot factory in Cicero, and trudge home to a table empty of good bread. He sighed, and with his fingertip wiped away a tear. What I eat today, he 